Hey guys, it's Kevin again, and this is going to be for The Leftovers, Season 1, Episode 7, Soulless 4, Tired Feet. And finally, this show has actually done what I wanted them to do, which is basically take the whole idea of the, you know, Leftover show, not just be weird, but have it be weird for a reason. And now we have a reason for why it's being weird. And honestly, this was the first perfect episode of The Leftovers that was not, um, you know, single character driven. You know, last episode was amazing. I love last week's episode with Nora, you know, how it focused so much on her. But this episode went back to, you know, um, the Kevin storyline and the Tom storyline and things like that. Um... And we really saw a lot of connections between Kevin and Tommy in this episode. We really saw a lot of connections between the two of them. And um, I really enjoyed that about this episode, definitely. I thought that was absolutely, you know, fantastic. Um, and there were just so many great things that happened in this episode. And uh, let's just get to it. Because overall, I thought this was, as I said, the first perfect episode. I was really invested in this episode. And I'm going to admit it right now, guys. I like the show more than The Strain. I really do. I think this episode, you know, was a lot better than The Strain. I really enjoyed it. So basically we see Jill, she's getting into a friend's car and she spots her mother, Lori, who months ago left the family, of course, to join, you know, the GR. And the the mute white, you know, um, basically Jill is hurried into the car by her by um, Amy, who has attached herself to, you know, uh, Kevin and Jill, and plays both bad influence and protector to the catatonic Jill. And by the way, in this episode we actually saw a lot more of Amy, you know, Amy really... Um, has played a very big part in, um, with Jill, you know, whether it's good or bad. So, they head out to the woods where they apply themselves to seeing who can be shut up alone, alone the longest inside an abandoned refrigerator. And, you know, um, this is just something that teenagers would do, because, I mean, it's an abandoned refrigerator that somebody died in. Of course, you know, teenagers are gonna be like, hey, I wanna try that, so... Jill is about to break the record by lasting more than 25 minutes, but when her friends try to open the door and release her, the handle falls off, everyone panics, who is... You know, Jill almost dies, actually, as everyone screams helplessly. An old man uh, um, forces the door shut open, and uh, Jill is stunned by this, and the men, the man runs away, saying, Don't tell your dad you saw me. She explains that he is um, her, um, you know, that he is her grandfather on the loose from the mental hospital. So it's actually Kevin Sr. that we see that did that. So obviously Kevin Sr. has been released from the mental institution, which I thought was, that was just really big. So Kevin is driving home, um, um, Nora, with whom he has just gone on a date with, because if you remember at the end of the last episode, they had planned to go on a date, and basically outside Nora's house, they find two members of the GR, including Meg, um, you know, recent addition to the sect, um, and, and they also find, you know, basically Kevin asks them to leave, but Nora opts for a different approach, spraying them with the hose until Meg and her fellow watcher are soaked, completely soaked from head to toe. And, uh, basically, at home, Kevin finds Amy and Jill, who tells him his father is on the loose, and Jill asks, what did Grandpa do? Did he hurt anyone? And Kevin says, yes, he did, and he takes off the, um, takes off for the, uh, precinct, and he briefs the officers. They all know his father. He was Mableton's police chief until his explosive public breakdown, and Kevin visits Mableton's mayor, Lucy Warburton, who had some sort of relationship with the former police chief. We don't know what it is, but she had some sort of relationship with him. But Lucy's shocked to hear of an escape. After dismissing Kevin's request to search her house, she points out he's not coming to me, Kevin. He's coming to you. So he's basically after Kevin at this point. He knows that, you know, Kevin knows that his father is after him. And, um, yeah, so that, that was really big. So basically, Kevin um, props up his walkie-talkie on the coffee table, sits on the couch with a gun in his hand, apparently waiting for his father or something to enter the house. I really like the scene. He's just waiting for his father to enter the house. But instead, he hears a dog straining and whining, and there he sees that sharpshooter again, who we haven't seen since episode two. You know, the dog thing. We haven't even like ta they haven't even discussed it since episode two. And basically, he sees that sharpshooter, eyes bulging, cheek descended with chewing tobacco, urging him to come out and hunt feral dogs. And honestly, guys, the one thing that I thought the show did really well in this episode was the past two episodes we've seen of Kevin, of Kevin's storyline, has been basically filler. You know, the first one I had to do, like, some stupid doll, and the other one I had to do with, um, you know, the member, the GR member Gladys. That's what it really had to do with, and this episode really was, like, the first episode with, I'd say, a consistent, like, recurring storyline, really. So basically, um, he says, um, come on, chief. Kevin comes outside and then looks back at his house and sees his son, Tom, who calls out dad. And Kevin tries to reach back to him. 
Then suddenly is beside the hunter aiming and shooting a rifle, but there is no, there's still no evidence of a dog. So Kevin sees images of white clad corpses, uh, members of the GR, who have uh, been suffocated, and one of the faces inside the plastic bags is that of his former wife, Lori. The images disappears, and Kevin approaches the ma a mailbox that is rattling and shaking, as if a wild animal is thrashing around inside it. He approaches the mailbox and then wakes up on the floor of his bedroom. So obviously, again, he had another nightmare. So, I don't know why he keeps having these weird dreams. We really don't know. Um, basically, we, we really don't know why he keeps having this weird dream. Because basically, it might not be a dream, because when he pulls himself off the floor, his left hand is bandaged in bloody gauze. So, was it a dream, or what actually happened there? We really don't know. So, out the window, he sees this black dog tied up in his backyard, barking and snapping, which you basically find out here, no, it was not a dream, this actually did happen. So he goes down to the kitchen, and Jill and Amy are having breakfast. They only add to the confusion. Amy is, um, Amy basically, um, you know, is there and reminds Kevin that he brought the dog home last night before Kevin can confess that he remembers nothing. His phone rings, and the police spot his father at the library, but he got away. So he races over to that reading room, which his father has apparently ransacked, and a worker tells Kevin that the old man asked to borrow $200, saying he needed it for his son, and, um, yeah, so that's really big. And I really like that scene also, because the worker actually is a foreign worker, and Kevin was actually speaking another language to him. I think, I think that's the first time I've seen HBO do that. I think that was really cool, actually. So back at the Garvey house, Jill is alone, hears the dog barking, and outside she sees her grandfather and invites him in for something to eat. Now, of course, her grandfather's a maniac, and he his appearance outside, he has spurts of unlizable logic. He laments these scared kitchen cabinets that hasn't been repaired or replaced since the deer broke in. And when Jill asks how he, how he knew to rescue her, he says it was an obvious next step after coming across a bunch of idiots yelling into a refrigerator. So he then has to borrow $200. Jill says she has no money, but shows her grandfather Kevin's stash of prescription anti-anxiety medication and sleeping pills. That is really important because that could be the reason why Kevin keeps having these really weird, um, you know, fantasies and really weird dreams. So, basically, Kevin bursts into the house, tosses a set of handcuffs at his father. He's about to arrest his father. They get into the car, and Kevin's father asks, how are you sleeping? And warns his son about too many tranquilizers. Kevin declines to be drawn to a discussion, all of a sudden, they're in a melee, with the car surrounded by uh, GR d demonstrators. Kevin's father leaps out, runs into the crowd. I thought this scene was really intense. Kevin chased after him, runs in full tilt into Patty, um, the GR leader, of course, and Lori and Meg help Patty to her feet. And instead of apologizing, Kevin is enraged at, enraged at the cult and furious that his father once again has gone away. Also, the other thing that I really liked about this episode was the GR really, the, even though that was a thing in the episode, that was to the side. I like that because the past two episodes have focused heavily on the GR, and I don't care about the GR. I really like their storyline. I think it definitely adds and makes things more interesting. But the whole thing with Kevin and his father I thought was definitely more interesting than the GR, in my opinion. So then Kevin returns home to find Amy, but there's no Jill. We don't know where Jill is. And Amy's watching television. And he's very spooked when Amy tells him, do you not remember what happened the night, the night before? And it's like, what? What happened the night before? Um, Kevin races upstairs, empties out his prescription medicine bottles, flushing the tranquilizers down the drain, heads outside, tossing some meat to the dog, digs up one of the flagstones in the patio, and his father had been searching. And he finds the jar of Jif with a roll of $100 bills, as well as the uh, printout of Reverend Math Jameson's um, scandal sheet on a departed judge who took bribes. And then Kevin goes over to Matt's house. He wants to talk to him, you know, to demand to see his father because he think, he's thinking his father is hiding in Matt's house. And Matt says he isn't there, but he speaks to Kevin on the phone, agrees to meet a diner in 90 minutes. And at the diner, Kevin and his father sit in a booth, and as the voices inside the uh, older man's head grows insistent, his conversation becomes increasingly unhinged. He warns Kevin that whistle blew three years ago, and you can't ignore it anymore. Your services are being requested. Now, Kevin is not having this. He does not care. He thinks this is bullshit, what his father's saying. And he points out that his father was never there when Kevin wanted him. And now you want me to infect with whatever it is you've got? So the argument escalates, and Kevin's father punches him before taunting him, before taunting everyone else in the diner. And he says, just don't wake up. Don't anybody wake up. Go to sleep. And Kevin and his father get into an enormous fight. I really like the way this was done. They were playing, like, a really, like, old classical music song. And it was done really well. Just, I really like the way they did that song. So the police eventually tackle the old man, take him away. 
And, um, yeah, so definitely, I thought that was definitely a very interesting scene. Kevin then rebuffs, um, Reverend Jameson's effort to explain things he, and, um, you know, he doesn't really say anything. So he goes over to Nora's house, and he ends up having sex with her. Um, and by the way, I really like the chemistry between Kevin and Nora. I'm thinking they're gonna get together, definitely. I, I see a lot of chemistry between the two of them. They end up sleeping together, and he warns her, I think I might be going crazy. You know, he says that to her. And that is the part that I was just like, yes, finally. Finally, they're addressing why he's having these dreams. Because he's thinking he might be going crazy. And, he, you know, he just he's thinking he's going crazy. So guess what happens after this? Basically, what ends up happening is Kevin then comes home the next day to see Jill and Amy. And there he sees the National Graphic. Um, the National Graphic magazine. Kem, and basically, Kevin Sr. told her to order it. But he's enraged and throws it in the trash. Wants nothing to do with his father, basically. Jill, you know, walks away. She has no idea what's going on. He hears the dogs outside, picks up the National Geographic out of the trash to read it, and I don't know what he's going to do from there. I'm thinking this is just reiterating the fact that maybe there's something in that National Geographic magazine he doesn't want to see. I really don't know what the National Geographic is really all about. I really don't know. I guess we'll just have to see, but I really love the main plot of this episode. I really loved where it went. I love how, you know, interesting it was in this episode, especially with the whole, you know, what's going on with Kevin's father. I think that's definitely going to be very interesting. We're really looking forward to seeing more of that. So let's go over to Tommy. Uh, Tommy in this episode, you know, he had a lot to do. Um, he is starting to lose his devotion to um, the cult of, of the Holy Wayne. Now, of course, we saw Holy Wayne last week um, take all the pain away from Nora, and, you know, um, Basically, Tom has been on the run for months. Ever since new service of uh, Wayne's affinity for underage girls, he's been moving around the country and protecting Christine because that's what Wayne said to do. And he's about, and Christine is actually about to give birth to the healer's child. So she's holed up in Gary, and Christine has fallen ill, and Tom despires of ever hearing from Wayne again. He just doesn't even care if he hears from him again. But just as he is wandering um, the aisles of a pharmacy, Wayne ends up calling, and he instructs him to deposit an envelope of cash near a mailbox in town. And he says it won't be long now. Um, and basically, although it's not clear what that means, Tom is very wary, and Wayne sounds ad um, addled and a little out of it. And we see that he probably is, so... He hungers down, half naked on a blanket in what appears to be an industrial basement. And basically what ends up happening is that um, he follows, he has followed his orders. He delivers, you know, the envelope of cash to the bottom of the mailbox. And we see another young man retrieve the envelope. So Tom follows him to a motel. Tom forces his way into the room, demanding to see Wayne. And instead, he finds a situation similar to the one he left behind. You know, there's something else going on there, definitely. And uh, basically... What ends up happening is we see this 20-something man keeping watch in squalor over to a very pregnant young woman. A very pregnant young woman. She's also pregnant, just like Christine. And she believes um, she is actually carrying Wayne's baby or some kind of savior. And the two men are sound to learn that Wayne has dipped them. Um, the pregnant young woman is far more upset and demands to know who the other woman is. And Tom says, you know, of course, it's Christine. And the other man um, muses, how many others do you think there are? And Tom laughs and asks, does it matter? So the woman appears with a gun, begins firing at them, and a bullet strikes Tom's hand, and he escapes to his car. Um, so that was just really, really intense what happened there. And basically, Tom then eventually returns to the hideout, finds Christine is missing, and the bed is empty, and there's a trail of blood across the room. So Tom warily follows the stairs to the bathroom, Finds Christine in the tub, and she looks more shocked than overjoyed because she has just had her baby and tells him it's a girl. So, obviously, that is really big. She just had her baby. But why is she not happy about this? I don't know. Why? I really don't know what's going to happen here, definitely. I mean, The Leftovers is one of those shows where you really don't know what's going to happen. I do kind of want to know what's going on with, uh, with uh, Kevin, though, definitely, because why is Kevin going crazy? Do you think he is actually going crazy? I think he really is. I mean, think about the things he's been going through. A disappearing bagel, disappearing shirts. Like, he's been getting upset over it, and now we really know why, because he thinks he is going crazy. And I'm thinking what's going to happen is that he really is going crazy. And what actually did happen the night before? Why was Jill not there that night before? What actually happened? We don't know. I'm, I mean, I'm very interested in figuring out what's going to happen, what happened the night before. We saw a promo where he goes over to, um, to someone and says, can you tell me the events of what happened last night? And it's going to be very interesting to see what happened that night before, you know, because Amy told him, don't you remember what happened? And he said he didn't remember. So 
I don't know what's really going on there. As far as, um, again, the one thing I liked most was that the GR was to the side in this episode. I really like that, definitely. As far as Kevin Sr. goes, I don't know what's going to happen with him. I'm pretty sure we're going to see him again, but I really don't know. Do you think we can trust him? I really don't know if we can trust him. I personally, I don't trust him right now. I don't know what's going to happen. What does that National Geographic thing have to do with? I personally don't know what that has to do with, really. So it has to deal with something, but I don't know what it really has to deal with. Um, as far as um, Tom goes, I don't know what's going to happen with Christine. You know, Christine just had her baby and everything. I don't know what's going to happen with her. We'll have to see what happens there, but I'm very interested in seeing what's going to happen. But I personally don't know what's going to happen. I can't say what's going to happen, but um, I really don't know what's going to happen there. I guess we'll just have to see. And is there anything else I really need to talk about? No, I think it's actually pretty much... Oh, also, I really like Kevin and Nora together. The thing I like about Kevin and Nora is they're just, like, fun scenes to watch. There's this earlier scene where Nora and Kevin are talking, and there's nothing crazy going on. It's just them having a conversation, and I really like that. I like that uh, Nora's actually calming Kevin down a little bit. I like that. I really like this chemistry between Nora and Kevin. As I said, Nora definitely is my favorite character on this show, and she continued to be in this episode. I do like that... Ever since Nora, what I really like that the show does is when they take that single episode, they start to show more of that character, and, you know, before they did that with Matt, you know, Matt was in the fourth episode, had a lot to do in the fourth and fifth episode, and now in this episode, Nora had a lot to do, so I really like that, definitely. So is Nora gonna try to help Kevin, you know, I'm thinking Kevin definitely is going crazy and he needs to get some help, because obviously he is going crazy, but I really don't know what's going on there. Do you guys think Kevin's going crazy? I personally think he is, but I really don't, obviously, I, I don't know, you know, I can't give a definitive answer of what's going on there. That's also, was that thing of the dogs, was that real or was that a dream? I really don't know. We don't know if that was a dream or not. I don't know if that was a dream or what's going on there, but I guess we'll just have to see. But that's basically it for my review. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me know what you guys saw this episode. Overall, I thought this was the best episode of the season. Um, this episode really, besides the single character focused episodes where it focused on one character, this was the first perfect episode where it was multiple storylines and it worked really well. I was really into the storyline of Kevin's father. And there's only three episodes left, so I feel like from here it's only going to get better. And I really love what the show is doing. I really hope the show continues to be as good as this episode was. Also, really like that we saw more of Amy in this episode as well. I thought that was definitely really good. But that's it for my review. Hope you guys enjoyed it. See you guys in my next video, which will be my review for The Strain. So I'll see you guys for that. Okay, bye.